All right. Everybody have a good first day? All right. Thank you to all those great speakers today. And thanks to everyone for coming back. I want to take a little minute and uh, before I bring out the panelists, I just want to give a little bit of, of uh, introduction to what I'm trying to accomplish here. I mean, I think a lot of us are really super interested in all this stuff around AI, but we don't always know what it means in practice. And so as we were thinking about what to do with this panel, it really came down to, hey, you know, I happen to like old Westerns. Some of you may know the old Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. They said, hey, that's a great theme for AI in practice, because I think anybody who's done this in the real world knows that there's times where you're like, wow. There's other times where you're like, with an S. And then there's other times where you're just like, what the happened? And, and so I wanted to bring on to the stage some people who can talk about all of those different experiences. They all have great backgrounds, uh, both academic as well as industry, in terms of actually putting this stuff into the real world. So my goal here, and, and I think the goal of any good panel, is really about you all. How do we answer the questions that you have? How do we get real answers to real questions? Right? And, and really, how do we dig into what stuff works and what doesn't? So in terms of format, it actually mirrors the, the title of the panel. We're going to spend some time, probably about 15, 20 minutes. We're not going to have a hard stop. If we're having a good conversation, we're going to keep going. Uh, and then there's an opportunity for you as the audience to step up and ask questions. I think we have two microphones kind of mid-tier here. So maybe if you've got some questions for the panelists on some of the things you've heard, as we get closer to that 15 minutes in or later on, uh, about 40 minutes in, and you want to ask some questions, just stand up and walk to those microphones. And I do want to stress, you know, please do ask questions. This is not uh, uh, your time to go and pontificate on and on around, you know, your opinion of the, the world. But, but do ask questions of the panelists. Let's take advantage of them up front. So with that, let's bring out our panelists. So first, I want to welcome to the stage Daniel Tungenling. Daniel is the founder and former chief scientist of Indeca. You'll notice the panelists may or may not have some drinks in hand as well, just like you. Next up, we've got Anapuma Joshi from Reddit. Anapuma is the director of search. I also want to give a special thank you to her because uh, uh, she is a last minute substitution for one of our other panelists who got stuck with some uh, visa issues entering the country. So uh, I, I do appreciate her standing in uh, and I, I owe her a great debt of gratitude. Next up we've got Josh Willis from Slack who's a software engineer, former uh, engineering director. <laughs> Recovering Engineering Director. Thank you very much. I also want to just highlight, because we're talking about AI, uh, Josh's most popular tweet here. He's famous for great definition of data scientist. I often think, though, a data scientist is just a statistician who moved west. <laughs> Last but not least, we've got Kavita Ganason from GitHub. All right, so let's get started. So first off, what we're gonna do is, I've got a few questions just for uh, the panelists that really focused in on the good around it. And, and so to get things kicked off, and I'm just gonna go down the line here for each of the panelists, I wanna, I wanna just have you all reflect on what's the biggest win you've had with this machine learning stuff, with AI, just that, that example where you're just like, wow, uh, and so maybe we'll start off with you, Daniel. Sure. So I think my favorite example is, comes from query categorization. I was working with a client who had taken the time to annotate head queries with what categories there were, and that was great for the 30 40% of the impressions they covered. And for the rest, they had no data. The queries they just didn't have enough information. And so what they simply did was build uh, a model using FastX, a character-based embedding model, and suddenly, basically, the tail was 
almost trivial to categorize just as well as the head, partly because of the observation that tail queries are often more specific than the head queries they're similar to. And it's one of these things in retrospect was, seems obvious, but it, from either from impressions or from unique queries, uh, from impressions it doubled the number covered and from unique queries went for, you know, easily by, by order of magnitude uh, and increased. And that was just, again, just a simple uh, embedding based classifier. Uh, that's great. Anu? Yeah, so um, at Reddit, we were started our search pro progress last year, and we went to phrase matching and for searches, and then we wanted to improve our relevance, and simple thing we started doing with um, was the signal aggregation. What are users clicking on and ranking them higher into the search results? And that increased for our post results, which is constantly changing. It increased our relevance by 12% and our CTR by around 10% which was a huge gain for, for Reddit search. So it was a simple mechanism, but it helped us so much getting, getting what we wanted. Nice. And, and that simple thing is something I think we're gonna visit throughout the talk here. Josh, uh, how about yeah. you? Uh, so I used to work at Google. Uh, I worked on ads quality. So like this is like back in like 2008, 2009, figuring out where ads should go, how much people should pay for them, all that kind of good stuff. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that joke so much. I, Last can't, I can't let it go. Yeah. Sorry. So for me, it's about improving our programming language detection model. So what we currently have is very heuristics-based, and it's also very slow. So we have been recently experimenting with a deep learning model, and we saw big wins in terms of uh, classification time. Like, it's about 100 times faster, and it's also about 10% more accurate. So that was our recent biggest win. And that's detecting programming language. So, so as, us as engineers, as we're putting in our code, you're on the fly categorizing where, what type of code. What type of programming is. language it is. Wow, very cool. Yeah. And Kavita, let's, let's continue with you. I mean, you know, a lot of what we want to focus in on here is around how do we get AI to production. And I know, you know, reading your blog and, and since you're at GitHub, one of the things you, you first started working on there was the, the suggestions, the topic recommendations. This project is about X. Can you share what kind of that journey was of, of, of bringing this first machine learning pipeline into to GitHub? Sure. Um, so topic recommendations is about recommending labels that you could use to characterize your repository. So for example, if you have a data science repo, you might see labels like data science, machine learning, neural networks. So it's a way for you to um, show off what you have within your repo, and it also helps a lot with discovery. So one of the biggest problems um, I had with this project is the lack of data. So how do you predict what kind of uh, labels you should recommend? Um, so what I did was um, I looked at like 50 to 100 repo, just manually went through the repo just to figure out what kind of information characterizes a repo. So it turns out that the top level readme and the description usually has information about what's in a repo. So that was my data source. So I used that to extract specific keywords that would then become candidate labels uh, that would be suggested to users. But of course, under the hood, you would have different algorithms to filter out which are the good keywords and which are the bad keywords. So the hope is that we will just show the good keywords to the users. And um, what is the? Well, just, you know, what was the impact then of, of how did you measure that getting into production? Yeah, so in terms of how we evaluated it, there were two parts to it. One was um, offline evaluation before we launched. So that we had a small quantitative component, but a lot of it was qualitative. So every day I would go in and see the recommended tags and also what's in the repos to see if it makes sense. So I did this across like very different types of repos, like highly populated ones, not so populated ones, data set repos, um, code repos. So it was a lot of qualitative evaluation. Mm -hmm. Then post-launch was the interesting part. So we were monitoring um, what is the acceptance rate. So given five topics, how many were being accepted? Mm -hmm. So it turns out the acceptance rate was about 60% on average. So it's not too bad for just after launch. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Josh, I want to turn to you a little bit because I think uh, Kavita hit on something interesting. You know, in, at GitHub, you, you don't really get to see all the data that she's trying to learn and train off of. And I imagine, obviously, at Slack, you know, security is of 
of huge importance. And, and I think one of your challenges there is, as, as we've talked about, is you don't get to see the data either. So how do you go about measuring the effects of, of what you're doing in search and machine learning at Slack on, on, on essentially data that you can't see? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we don't see messages, we don't see queries, like none of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it is, it is very much a challenge. I mean, to a certain extent, obviously you rely on like classic IR stuff, you know, good old BM25 and that sort of thing, <laughs> but it really only gets you so far, you know, especially when you have very short chat messages and stuff like that. So it's a few different things. Um, we obviously are very interested in subsequent behavior. Collect data obviously is like critically important. Um, some of the interesting sort of like non-obvious things uh, you might see is people often tend to share messages. When they successfully find a message they're looking for, they will share that message back into a channel as like a sort of known item recovery. And that is generally like a very positive, strong signal for us from a quality perspective that we have correctly identified a message you were looking for, like that kind of thing. But yeah, it, you rely like extensively, extensively on implicit behavior um, and sort of your understanding of a user's relationship with their channels, with other users on the team they communicate with um, as a proxy when you can't, when you can't look at like yeah. the actual sort of information itself, yeah. That's great, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I think we see that in a, in a lot of the people in the audience I've talked to, we've, we've seen those kinds of issues as well. Uh, not to skip over you, Anu, but I'm going to come back to you. Daniel, I want to, I want to then touch on, uh, you know, as a, as a consultant, I imagine you've seen a lot of different uh, search problems and, and machine learning problems across the work that you do. You know, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for the, the folks in the crowd here to, to really apply this stuff in practice across whatever their domain is? So, I mean, I see a lot of common themes across, across folks. But one of the things that, uh, I see is frankly a bit of an anti-pattern is that people search teams focus a huge amount on ranking. Uh, often they uh, either are trying to improve their machine learned ranking or they're uh, trying to move from a hand-tuned ranking model uh, to one that uses uh, MLR or, or LTR. I have nothing against machine learned ranking. Some of my best friends do machine learned ranking. But uh, the, uh, I feel that they neglect the other parts of the pipeline. And so uh, I see huge wins from focusing either on uh, improving the document representations, and that can be anything from uh, you know, named entity recognition or other, uh, other ways of extracting structure classifiers, and now, of course, a lot of work being done with embeddings, or a flip side on the query side, uh, doing, again, query classification, entity recognition, and so forth. And one of the things that I see there is that a lot of the work on ranking that people do where they rely on query-dependent features uh, really is trying to make up for not having the representations of queries and documents so that you have a better recall set. Particularly, I work a lot with retailers where you, know, you might want to expose a sort by price, at which point you can't rely on uh, a, a learned model for ranking uh, to solve all of your problems. So I would say that the opportunities tend to be at the edges, right, at the query side and at the document side. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the highest leverage. If you have those perfectly, then by all means, uh, improve your ranking as well. Oh, very good. <clears throat> Andrew, turning to you then, uh, you know, one of the things that impressed me about your background is you've actually worked across a lot of different industries. You know, obviously you're at Reddit here and now, but you know, you've done some work in biology, you've done some work in, in uh, education. Maybe spend, spend a little bit talking about all the different ways you've, you've done search and machine learning across, across your background there. Yeah, so um, at Check, we were trying to do use search for two reasons in the beginning. First is basically people finding their textbooks they want to rent for. And the other thing we were using was our admissions product where connecting students to the schools they are looking for. And that basic recommendation model was based on solar search. Uh, but then eventually we wanted to sophisticate the model, get the feedback uh, channeled in, because we were basically trying to search based on the user's uh, preferences. But people say that they want to uh, find school in California, but they keep looking on schools on East Coast, or they say private schools, but they look at public schools. So how do you channel that? And that, that's where we channel the machine learning models to figure out you know, how to best recommend schools, based, not based on just the preferences, but based on their behavior. So it's just building feature store to recommend the models. So that, that's where, uh, and it, 
next propagated into homework help and textbook solutions and how to help them you know figuring out what they are looking for in the in a variety of data was available uh, in the biological models the genomic data processing analytics pipeline there is nothing called common sense in other ways you know in any other model you can say that hey i was looking for ipad and you didn't show me the ipad but in genomic data you can't really say that and it's machine learning is the only way you have to trust that you know this is going to you know show you the correct result set whether it's a clustering whether it's a supervised learning unsupervised learning but that's the only way you have to go with so um, hmm. that's how we succeeded in my both the companies and even in reddit we are going the same way to get more results which are directly relevant to the users Picking up on the life sciences theme, uh, Kavita, I know you've done a lot, a lot of work in clinical text mining. Perhaps you know, share with the audience some of the, the wins you've had there around you know, bringing this stuff to, to bear on a problem. Yeah, so one of the problems that I worked on is trying to predict billing codes from clinical text. So as you know, clinical texts are highly unstructured. Uh, physicians just narrate, and it's just like a blob of text. So one project was trying to uh, create structure from completely unstructured text. So this is the past medical history section. This is the list of medications. So machine learning helped a lot with that because uh, once you have the structures, then you can use only specific sections to predict building codes. And that significantly improves the uh, accuracy. Mm. Great. Yeah. Shifting gears, I mean, I think if we're going to talk about the good happening in AI, we'd be remiss to, to not talk about deep learning, right, and, and all of the gains that are, are coming forth. We had a, a great keynote this morning from Dr. Bengio and really showcasing some of the places that, that it, uh, it really starts to shine. I mean, perhaps to open this up for the broad panel for anybody who really wants to jump in and who has a strong opinion perhaps on deep learning, but you know, like, let's, let's talk a little bit about when should we use these more expensive ones and when should we use some of the simpler ones. I think Josh back, backstage, you talked a, a little bit about, hey, you know, just sometimes this logistic regression thing just beats everything. Yeah. And then other times these, these other models, I know Kavita, we talked about, uh, uh, just start to shine. So maybe, you know, let's, let's jump in on deep learning and maybe kick things off there, Josh. Um, I mean, yeah, I, so I don't have a ton of experience in deep learning, especially not compared to really most of this audience, I would say. Um, I've seen very, very simple models do exceptionally amazing things for very long periods of time. I've seen, uh, I, I think, you know, both, both Google and Facebook had a really hard time replacing some of their very core models which they had evolved over like the course of a decade for ad prediction, for search ranking, so on and so forth, with deep learning models. Uh, the deep learning model would do well, and it could be trained relatively quickly, like in a matter of months or whatever, but it still couldn't beat the sort of like long-standing, historical, hand-tuned, expertise-driven model that had been built over a decade, and so on and so forth. And it's really taken them a long time to get to the point where they actually could push beyond everything they had built um, over, over that period of time. I think it's really, it's most exciting for companies that don't, that haven't invested decades right. in optimizing this stuff, where like you can kind of cheat and get state of the art performance, you know, in like six months instead of over the course of like 10 or 15 years. Like that's, to me, the most exciting thing about it. It's so, it's so blissfully easy. <laughs> I think like one of the hard things was, for a long time for me, was deciding whether it was even worthwhile to invest in building a machine learning model. Because yeah. you didn't know if it was going to work or not, right? And you had to gather all this data and do all this kind of stuff. And now with deep learning, you really can find out in a matter of weeks or months, is this going to work at all? Like really. Um, my yeah. favorite application actually is, is, is uh, oil and gas, uh, deep like drilling seismology stuff where they just generate enormous amounts of data to figure out where oil is underneath like the Gulf of Mexico and so on and so forth. And they can take, you know, they can train deep learning models in weeks that can replicate the performance of experts who have decades of experience in identifying this stuff. And it's just like absolutely incredible to me that this is possible now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and Kavita, I think you mentioned your, your language detection model is, is deep learning based. So yep. perhaps drill in, drill in on that. So back in the days, <laughs> my favorite go-to model was logistic regression. Now that we have access to lots and lots of data, I just tried the deep learning model and it turns out it works really well. And it's really fast to train. So I think, and it's a simple neural network. It's not really deep. So you have to use the right kind of architecture for the right problems, and you'll see big wins. Yeah. 
Anyone, any of the other two want to chime in on deep learning? I mean, I think everybody's got to have an opinion these yeah. days if they're going to be in the machine learning space. So, Daniel? So I, I was a bit of a, of a late convert. I, I met uh, Jan LeCun when he was a professor at NYU uh, and was working on what I think were called uh, deep neural networks. But they, deep learning wasn't a thing yet. And uh, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think I was a kid, but I wasn't that young. And I thought, look, this is very nice. It's a great way of identifying handwritten digits, but without explainability, I just didn't see the practical utility. Mm. Um, to my, you know, at least it was 2008 or so. So at the time, maybe my skepticism was justified. Of course, a decade later, it's obvious he was very right and I was very wrong. But uh, I would say that one of the things, and this echoes, I think, uh, Josh, what, what you're saying, you know, deep learning is really great if you've set up the problem correctly, if you have the right training data, if you have the right objective function, in the case, also things like loss functions, never mind the other challenges of setting, you know, the sort of hyperparameters. On the other hand, if there are reasons to believe that you don't have the right training data because of some skews, or perhaps your objective function isn't what you thought it was, like clicks aren't necessarily positive events, or abandonments aren't negative ones, et cetera, then having a model that isn't explainable makes it that much harder to figure out what you did wrong. And in those cases, things like logistic regression or you know, reasonably sized random forest or what have you are far easier to debug. There's a much higher chance you'll be able to see what's going wrong. It's not to say you can't debug a deep learning model, but it's more work. So I would say that people who jump from nothing to deep learning had better be sure that the inputs they're giving are good because it'll be very hard to tell when you're making a mistake. Yeah, and I think in the, in the morning our keynote speaker showed us pictures of the dog and yeah. one computer identified yeah. as an ostrich versus dog. I think that speaks yeah. to what you're saying. So. Mm. And by the way, so if you, if you do have questions, please feel free to make your way up to the mic. Uh, you know, so speaking of data, I mean, I, I think Anu, uh, Reddit probably has more data than most people, fair to say. So how do you think about, you know, like, and, and obviously query understanding and relevance is super important at, at Reddit, and you've, you've made a lot of investments in improving your search. You know, how do you approach the problem of relevance, and how does, how does machine learning factor in that for you? Yeah, so basically, um, to improve relevance, as I mentioned, we use the user signals, we use collaborative filtering to recommend things. We just try to figure out, like, what was yesterday people were searching, and the simple uh, statistical difference between the queries to figure out what is trending today. So just basic fundamental models of, uh, like, logistic regression is one of the, you know, main one for personalization to get the results to what is user wants to see. You know, what is user subscription models, what is user uh, commenting, voting, and that's what we take into account of the parameters to build simple models to show them the content they, they might be looking for. And that has worked well so far. And you know, there might be more deep learning and uh, you know, other models will be coming in the future. But right now, these simple tricks are really making users happy. And even today, we met a couple of people who came to us and say, hey, we are heavy editors. And you, know, you guys have really fixed the search. And we really appreciate that. And you know, that's what we want to hear. And with like these small low-hanging fruits, uh, they are not really low-hanging, but you know, in, compared to deep learning, probably they are really low-hanging. Uh, we are really achieving great results from that. Yes. Great, thank you. Again, anybody in the audience? Otherwise, uh, you know what we can do is, or what I'd like to do is, let's shift gears a little bit and go into the lightning round. All right? Sure. Maybe get a little bit more. I think you all need to drink more or something out there. <laughs> Somebody needs to just like stand up and and. And take that first step. Maybe a LucidWorks employee needs to stand up and ask that first question just to, to break the ice here a little bit. I, I guess I failed as a moderator in that I should have had a plant uh, already set up. So this is how you know it's authentic and live, right? There's a hand up back there. You want to come to the microphone? If you can make your way up to the mic, please, like that would right be appreciated. Just uh, so we can all ask. hear you. <laughs> all right. Is there a mechanism for continuously testing and evaluating uh, these deep learning models? Because the, the, the base cases or the, the conventional wisdom, the 
common ground at the beginning may shift uh, over the life cycle of the application. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how does it happen in an ongoing basis? It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, and, and actually, I'm going to broaden it a little bit, just because I, I don't think it's just deep learning. Let's let's spend a little bit of time as a panel on, you know, how do we explain this stuff? How do we deal with it over time of A/B testing and and all of that kind of stuff? Anyone want to uh, take the lead on that one? Feel strongly about how we measure this stuff? Yeah, I've been deeply screwed by this in the past. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, yeah. I mean, so when I first started at Google. Um, you know, it was, it was like 2008, it was sort of pre-deep learning era, but, you know, we, we had lots and lots of different machine learning models, and they all fed into each other. And so, like, my kind of, like, watchword for, like, you know, machine learning AI disaster is, is feedback loops. Mm -hmm. Feedback loops from models, where the input to one model depends on the output from another model, which is being fed back into that model, which is generating the data going into this model, that no one can really understand, that are being, like, retrained on different cycles from each other, that lead to these like positive or negative feedback loops. Um, so we had this, this incident where uh, the ad system at Google started showing fewer ads uh, over the course of about a month or so, and we adjusted the knobs and the tuning parameters to kind of like crank the ads back up again. But after we did that, they started falling again, and basically no one could figure out like what was going wrong with the system because we had built something that was too complicated for anyone to understand. <laughs> I was relatively new to Google at the time, and I said to my, my mentor, this guy named Daniel Wright, Daniel, is it possible that the ad system has become self-aware? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it doesn't like ads. <laughs> right? So, you know, Anyway, we ended up like figuring out, finally teasing apart. It took like months, but we finally managed to tease apart the problem. And so I'm actually kind of like bullish on deep learning because instead of building these independent systems, which are effectively deep networks, there's layers and layers yeah. and layers, we're now training this stuff all together. And in some ways we can kind of like better modularize the complexity and kind of contain it so that as we do continuous retraining on that same model, we don't have to worry about those external feedback loops about what this other team is doing with their model and so on and so forth. So I actually feel like it, it gives us actually a path forward out of some of these really negative situations. Anu, maybe to ask you to reflect a little bit, because you actually shared some concrete numbers there of, of some recent relevance improvements. So maybe if you could spend a little bit of time, how does Reddit approach this problem of measuring whether this stuff works? Yeah, so we, uh, we, whenever we want to put something in production before that, we try to run an A-B testing model. You know, we'll create control groups and, you know, basically typical model and see, try to see what lift we are getting. So if, you know, the numbers are really changing or they are very close and very, they are statistically significant or not. So um, trying to measure that, I mean, of course, we don't want to go below the numbers which we had previously for good things, so even if it, they are statistically insignificant, but they are a little bit better, then we'll try to put that in production or increase the data subset or try to put it onto a different model. So for our uh, feeds model, which uh, the home feed for Reddit, we have been going from the versions V0, V1, V2, so we are on a V8 version right now uh, for that. So we go very slowly and try to measure the performance at each cycle figuring out how the users are, re user retention, user engagement is getting measured. Mm. Anyone else wanna chime in? Uh, I wanna make sort of a broader point about A-B testing, which I think sometimes is lost on people, which is that when you do a proper A-B test, you're typically changing one thing, and the intention, it's a controlled experiment, you're supposed to hold the rest of the world constant, mm. but you often extrapolate from that that the thing you're changing in isolation is what matters. And it doesn't have to be a search ranking change. Let's say you're changing the size of a search box or some other interface change. And let's say you try a change like that and it fails, or you try a change like that and it succeeds. You then come away with, oh, that change was good or that change was bad. But if the rest of your, your application changes, at some level that experiment is no longer valid. You didn't, ch you didn't test that one thing in absolute, you just assumed that that change would be transferable to any other context. So you'll get, for example, people saying, well, we tried that before and it didn't work. Mm. Or even that's actually not as bad as saying, we're convinced this is something positive when it may be that the world has changed in some other way. Like you made some ranking change, but now your search interface has changed in some other way. Now, people don't like to revisit the past 
But I think it is important to remember that your test was only valid under the conditions when you did it, and it's a leap of faith to extrapolate it generally. Yeah, I mean, I think this whole notion of reproducibility is a really interesting one. I think it broader, more broadly, we see this in all of science of, of you know, what do we do about reproducibility? You, see, you hear about a lot of pharmaceutical companies who are actually spending a lot of money just trying to reproduce basic science. So yeah. let's, uh, let's put a pause on this. I think we've got uh, a good start to the, the panel in terms of, you know, some of the good stuff. But I think, you know, we're all really here to hear about all the stuff that doesn't work. So before we do that, though, let's just shift gears a little bit and jump into the lightning round. Now, I actually had you, you in the audience answer a few of these questions, and we'll show you some of the poll results later on, but I want to pose it to our panelists, and we're just going to go down the line here real quick. These, aren't, these aren't, don't require a super amount of thought or anything like that, but hopefully a little fun, hopefully just some enlightenment. And, and first off, I think you know, one of the big questions we often see is just like, hey, what does your stack look like? What, what do you do your day-to-day -day work in? So maybe, Kavita, start. Uh, what's your language of choice? It was Java, now it's Python. All right, Josh. A lot of time in SQL, across SQL. all environments, a lot of SQL. Python and Scala. Python and Scala. Python if it's up to me, Scala if it's not up to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think the, the NVIDIA CEO said that autonomous vehicles will be in production, in mass production by 2020. In other words, all of you can go out and buy one or at least hail one on your Uber or Lyft app. So uh, over or under, in other words, do you think it'll be greater than 2020 for us as consumers, especially here in the United States or Canada, to have autonomous vehicles or not? They'll be produced, but they won't be allowed. Not, not in that sort All of right. Mm. I agree with him. I, I think later, I don't think mass production happens until, until later in the so summer. So I, don't, I, don't, I won't get to kick back until after 2020. As long as, as long as it's before my son can drive. He's three. <laughs> but anytime in the next 13 years is like thumbs up with me. I think after 2020. After. Yeah, I actually was, I was doing a career day at my son's school and I had this exact aha moment <laughs> of like, I was talking to fifth graders and I'm like, wait, you may not even ever have to drive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, I think this one getting a little bit more practical. So how many data science experiments did you or your team run in the past 12 months? Uh, Kavita, you know, rough ballpark here, you know. Two or three. Two or three. Just, just my team? Yeah, I mean, you or know. like Slack as a whole. However you want to categorize it. I mean, Slack as a whole, hundreds, just our team, like probably 10 or, 10 or 15, something like that. Anu. Yeah, so my team ran between 10 and 15. Overall in the company, probably around 50 plus. 50 plus, great. I'd say my typical clients are running you know, five, five to 10 at least. So aggregate, of course, that adds up to a lot, but I think the normalized <laughs> number is probably the right one. Yeah. yeah, and just to put some perspective on that, I've heard some great talks from, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I like when you were at Google and, and you know, the, the big giants of the space, you know, this is really something I think we see a lot of, of really trying to drive this ability to do more experiments. Mm -hmm. So uh, drilling in a little bit, how many of those were actually positive results where you actually saw uplift or whatever your KPI was, you were like, this is, this actually improved? So about half. I, I will say that like it depends on whether people do serious offline experimentation first before they do online. And if they don't do the offline, it's way under half. And if they do the offline, it's closer to one. Anu. Yeah, around 60% or 55, I would say. Yeah. It's about a third, roughly speaking. Third. A, third, a third or positive, a third or like nothing, and a third or worse, roughly okay. speaking. Yeah. About two out of the three. Two out of three are yeah. positive. And you actually took my, my next follow-up question, which is maybe Kavita. How many are actually like, this was detrimental? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's detrimental, but probably the same. Just flat. Just flat, yeah. Okay. It didn't result in any change at all. Sam? I would say around 10 were negative, but, um, and 20 were like mostly flat, 20%. So. Yeah, I, I rarely see negative. What I see is people squinting at barely a change and trying to see if there's any way they can spin it as positive. <laughs> yeah, that, that I agree. So true. I really want this model to work. Exactly. Please work. Cognitive dissonance. <laughs> How can I slice this in a way 
I've never heard of Simpson's Paradox. La, 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 la. <laughs> well, you know, it is interesting. I think uh, uh, Ronnie Kovny, who runs the uh, Bing Experiment Management System, he actually talks about some cases where they actually were getting higher revenue off of experiment, experiments, but it was, they, they felt it was detrimental to the overall goals of what they were trying to do, so they actually pulled them. And I think that's something we can talk about more as after we get to the get past the, uh, the lightning round here, which isn't, you know, maybe not lightning, but maybe really fast train round. Uh, uh, I think we've maybe answered this one already, but, you know, deep learning is my go-to approach, agree or disagree, Kavita? Uh, disagree. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Come on, somebody agree. But, but <laughs> oh, for, sorry, I know. For text, I disagree. For images, it's obviously. For images, yeah. yes. I would say, yeah, yeah. If, if we right, get so image stuff. It all like depends that. on the problem. Yeah, depends images, on the problem. Images, clearly, it's a no-brainer. All right, you yeah. guys are too nuanced. Yeah, Come sorry. on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I don't really know what I'm going for here with the fill in the blank, but let's see what happens. AI means I never have to do what again? Mm. Well, feature engineering should be the answer if it were true. Feature engineering, and true. this doesn't necessarily just have to mean in your day-to-day -day job, but let's do keep it safe for work, uh, especially for Reddit. <laughs> oh, oh. Learn again. Hmm? Learn again. Learn again. Yeah. Learn again. Oh. Never have to drive again. Never have to yeah. drive again. Yeah. Never have to develop multiple models again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe to show you know that we're all not experts in everything, uh, Kavita. You know, as we look across search and artificial intelligence, what's you know as you look at this space, like what's one thing you just wish you knew more about? Um, learning to rank. Learning to rank. Yeah. Query understanding. I don't know if you guys know any experts. It'd be super helpful. User intent. User intent. Voice. Voice. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Looking a little bit at the bigger picture, agree or disagree, or actually on a scale of one to five, five being I strongly agree, and one being I strongly disagree, mm -hmm. AI will fundamentally reshape society at a grand scale in the next 10 years. Daniel? I'll go with five. Five, agree. Four. Four. Seven. <laughs> Seven, all right. Off the charts, Kavita. Five. All right, I think maybe we have a little bit of bias on the panel since we're all in this space. But, uh, well, I feel like it's, it's already yeah. been reshaping society for like yeah. decades Yeah, that's now. true. Like, I don't know, it'll continue to reshape society, yeah. uh, even more so, I don't know. And I think uh, I've got two more questions in this fast train mm -hmm. round, and I think, Daniel, this is something you spurred me on as we were talking, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll actually start with Kavita. Should AI actually have to explain itself? Because deep learning actually isn't very good at explaining itself. Does that actually matter? I think it does matter, especially for things like um, predicting building codes. You need to know why those codes were predicted. Yeah. So if you don't have evidence, then... But can human, yeah. you know, one of the counter questions is can humans actually explain themselves, right? So... I'd say no. Yeah, we no. can't. We're really incredibly good at coming up with post hoc rationalizations. So as long as AI can come up with reasonably plausible post hoc rationalizations, that's good enough. For <laughs> Yeah, I think AI yeah, should be able to explain itself. But humans do a pretty decent job of explaining the rationale itself. Great, and we'll, we'll come back to this one too, but Daniel. I've changed my mind. I, I used to be very strong on explainability, but I feel like explainability has now turned into a new AI problem in, mm. in effectively coming up with an explanation, so I, I kind of accept defeat. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this last one, I think maybe a little bit more controversial because I think as, as practitioners, we all live and breathe in AI and I think anytime you start to talk about regulations, but you know, the reality is, is if we look at the broader societal impacts of AI, you know, one of the things you start to, to think about is should there actually be like government or worldwide regulations on what we all do in terms of practice uh, you know, should there be, for instance, perhaps a, a global treaty on how AI is used in, in the real world? So uh, I guess agree or disagree? Uh, disagree with the proviso that I think people should have to, to be clear on their authorship. And that's, I'd rather see that, that providence as the answer rather than regulation of AI. Yeah, I don't agree with the uh, regulation also. So. I am torn. I have a, I'm, I'm going to give a long answer in the lightning round. And and I don't care. <laughs> um, right. I have a favorite book by Chuck Klosternut called I Wear the Black Hat, and it's, it's about villainry. And the thesis of the book is the villain in any story is the person who knows the most and cares the least. Mm. And when it comes to AI, 
the data scientist or machine learning practitioner in the world who cares the least is the person who decides what kind of society we live in. <laughs> Basically, I'm talking about Facebook here without saying their name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of think something has to be done, and I hate myself for saying it, but I kind of uh, think something has to be done. Kavita, follow that up, please. <laughs> I disagree, but I think we all should be responsible when we develop our models and Great. make sure things are representative and not biased. So. All right, and we'll come back to this, yeah. uh, this topic in the, uh, the <laughs> ugly section, if you will. So, all right, let's move on and let's, let's talk about the stuff that just doesn't work because I think we've all, we've all got a few here. And Josh, I wanna start this one off with you and I'm not actually gonna ask you a question. I'm just gonna say three words. Okay. Those three words are machine learning, PHP. <laughs> <laughs> It's a low blow, Grant. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Slack is predominantly a monolithic PHP, now hack, uh, web application. And for a very long time, almost all of our machine learning engineers have had to do feature engineering in PHP. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, everyone, everyone who's drinking can pour one out. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> everyone raise their glass to yeah. machine learning and the, PHP the learning there. I think. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I mean, I think it's, it's you know, to be fair, our, our chief architect, Keith Adams, has this great post in kind of in defense of PHP, and it definitely has virtues as an environment. Uh, machine learning does not happen to be one of them. For whatever reason, you know, Keras and TensorFlow have not been ported to PHP yet. I'm sure it's just a matter of time. <laughs> um, I, I will bet you there is a project on GitHub yeah. doing exactly I think, that. Yeah, so. It's actually almost certainly true. I think, I mean, the, the, the bad is really when machine learning engineers have to go deep into like, I mean, basically doing services and building systems and setting up Kubernetes clusters and why am I provisioning an etcd instance and like what is going on here? Like they get very, very far away from ML in the pursuit of an environment in production that can suit their needs and so on and so forth. So that's, that's kind of the ugly sadness that I, mm. I, I, I don't like to talk about. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's bad or ugly, it's, it's, it's definitely unpleasant. Yeah. 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 Kavita, perhaps, you know, I mean, uh, maybe you can re then reflect on what are some of the challenges, like, you know, wh where did it go wrong as, for instance, you were putting topics into production? Um, one is access to data. That's the most important one. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so Git data, we, we store some private data as well. So all our data is stored in some secure servers, so we don't have direct access for machine learning work. So we had to use some type of a workaround. So we use the Elasticsearch index, the scan the index and get the read means out. Mm. So that's a workaround, but it's, it's not perfect, but it does the job. Mm. Um, the second problem is having very robust models in production. So when a, a machine learning job fails in production, we don't know if it's the problem of the orchestration job or if it's the problem of the machine learning job. So debugging for data scientists is very difficult because that's not what we are trained on, yeah. and uh, yeah. so if we can have a robust pipeline to deploy machine learning models, that will really help. Great. Anu, let's switch to you a little bit here. Uh, you know, I think actually just a minute ago, you talked about statistical significance in, in your testing, and, uh, and as I was prepping here with Daniel uh, er, earlier in the month, you know, he made a comment to me that I think many people uh, perhaps can resonate here, re resonate with here, and that I think all too often we focus so much on this notion of statistical significance, and as Daniel said, that that squinting at the chart to see to see whether it actually was better or not. And and in my my sense is this often manifests itself with these kind of Frankenstein-like UIs or user experiences, where you know, for instance, uh, I've seen this with some retailers where there's a hundred different things on the page that all perform better, you know, perhaps, you know, as, especially as Reddit's been overhauling its user experience, how do you think about, how do you not only bring uh, a better result in terms of AI and capabilities, but how do you factor that in with your design goals as a, as a company, that, that UX experience, you know, how does, how does, how do you present the results factor in? So I think the user experience is always very essential to communicate what the results in the behind are trying to, you know, are trying to say. I, I don't know how to, how to put that rightly. But the UI is trying to communicate what the back end is going to produce the results. But 
as a search platform, um, the statistically significant results can be a variety of different things. For example, we launched an experiment called HVT, high value terms, where we try to index all our comments first and try to search on them, and that did not produce good results where people were searching. Uh, so we tried to use like you know high value terms, which are the TFIDF for like more prominent uh, phrases in the comment, and try to surface them. What it, what worked for that was increasing the recall size, or mostly working with uh, posts which have no uh, self text, but mostly pictures. Hey, look at this funny thing, you know, and then some picture of a hot dog, which is, and then somebody will say that's a mean looking hot dog, and then so somebody searches for a hot dog, that picture comes up. That is not very statistically significant if you launch an experiment, but uh, for, from the UI perspective, it's just trying to you know, highlight that term comment from that you know, wherever the search results pages are happening. So that communicated the user where the results are coming from. So long story short, basically the U UI is more to communicate what the backend is trying to show it and in the most effective way, rather than repeating what works best for like certain different cases. Mm. So, yeah, that Great. really works well for us. And by the way, if you have questions, please do come on up. I, I do want to make sure we have some audience participation here. All right. <laughs> there we go. Let's actually, let's take one out of there. Go ahead. So uh, many of us here, I think, are search engineers and have been watching wide-eyed as AI develops in this space, but don't necessarily have a data scientist on staff. So could you offer us some guidance uh, as we see today and tomorrow a lot of this learning to rank, boost with signals, so many different options. What, what would you tell us as search engineers would be the quickest way to begin to get value from AI? That's a great question. And of course, my answer is the vendor is <laughs> by fusion. Yeah. But Daniel, actually, let's turn to you on that one because yeah. I think since you you go across a lot of different customers, like how do you help your customers know when and where to do those things? Well, I mean, another way to think of it is what happens when you hire your first data scientist and they realize, wow, you haven't instrumented anything. So where is this data I'm supposed to science? Or, right? <laughs> um, or they're like, oh, I'm going to build these really cool models. Like, you could start by using counts. I mean, actually, to Josh's point, uh, SQL is a great language for a lot of things. And often, if you're making a change that's going to be dramatic, you can tell by comparing counts without needing to compute p-values that you know one option is better than another. So it is, this comes back, you know, so the, earlier today, uh, right, Yashua Benjo said that um, you can learn what you need to learn about deep learning in a year. You should certainly learn enough to be able to run rudimentary A-B tests in way less than that, using open source packages or vendor packages if needed, being able to do offline analyses, doing things like counts. So these sorts of things, among other things, make you realize you need to have your instrumentation, you need to have your tracking, your logs need to be clean enough at least to do sorts of, all sorts of reasoning before you're going to have the sorts of data that you will need to train models. So I think that that data maturity is the first step, and it comes with the benefits that you can do at least simple sorts of comparisons. I'd say beyond that, then you start to look at the more loosely coupled parts of your stack. Classification gets you enormous numbers of wins, and it's a relatively easy thing to do, again, uh, with, with off-the-shelf tools. Uh, you know, and you can do a lot of that before you get to, you know, document sentence word embeddings and sequence to sequence models. If you're at the point where you're worrying about that, you're already winning. Sure. Yeah, I think picking up on one thing you said in there, this notion of collecting the data, I mean, I think we all can relate to it. It's never good enough. Uh, but Anu, I mean, as someone who gets all kinds of data on their platform, I mean, talk about a little bit about how do you deal with bad data and, and how, what's your process look like for just like getting this stuff into any semblance of shape that you can actually do something with it? So um, on Reddit, we every data is user-generated data. So that's not really, we can't say that it's a bad data, but we want to make sure that, you know, it's- Some the, of it's bad data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what data we should surface based on, like what, who is searching for it. So for example, if somebody is, some women are searching for, you know, Father, how fathers should deal with their kids. Should we 
surface means write related content or should we not surface? <laughs> so that's very basic, uh, you know, bad data, good data kind of a concept. <laughs> and I think, you know, some of the understanding of like what user subscriptions is and their voting pattern, their viewing pattern does help it. And so as to Daniel's point, like, you know, basically all the instrumentation really, really helps us categorize the user because uh, Reddit doesn't keep too much user history or like, sorry, not user history, user data or user information. Users are mostly anonymous on, on Reddit. So all we have is their, their behavior pattern, which is like obvious to everybody else also. And that's what we try to figure out and, you know, you know, filter out that content. So I won't show, um, if I'm trying to look for, um, say, Obama, you know, the, the other, the Don, Donald or some channels which won't come up in my search history. Or, you know, if I'm searching for, uh, Stormy Daniels right now, you know, the NSFW content is not coming up, but, you know, just the drama around, you know, what happened in the last few months is just going to come out. So that's how we try to filter the good and bad content on, on Reddit. Great. And perhaps uh, uh, drilling in a little bit on that question, I mean, so perhaps we're opening it up to the, the broader panel here, but, you know, w there's, there's this question of how do I get started, and I think one of the things as practitioners here that perhaps you can share with the audience is like, what are some of the traps, you know, kind of the, hey, I wish I knew that when I was getting started for, you, uh, for the world. Maybe Josh, start with you on that one. Oh man, um, I don't know, so uh, when I showed up at Slack when I was director of data engineering and started like, okay, it's time to start collecting data, time to start building data infrastructure, all this sort of good stuff. Um, I very much built things the Google way, not knowing any other way to build things. Mm -hmm. And I made these sort of like, I, you know, Google did a decent, okay job, I guess, of building data infrastructure. So I didn't make that it many mistakes. It was in mistakes. PHP, right? Yeah, it was mostly PHP, yeah, no. Um, but I mean, the PHP thing was actually an attribute of it. Um, I, I think what I did not understand at the time was the difference between principle and path dependence. I, I knew exactly how Google built all of their data infrastructure, how all the logging worked, the querying, the experiments, knew how all of it worked. But I didn't understand which things Google did that were based on like good design principles in which were basically there was an intern named Kevin in the year 2000 who decided on a Tuesday to do something some way. And then all this infrastructure got built around it that made it seem like received wisdom and like the one only true way to do things when that really wasn't true. Yeah, so and, like and kind I, of the, the cargo culting a little bit. Yeah, cargo culting basically. I was, I was a Google data infrastructure cargo cultist and, and yeah. Slack was a very painful and humbling lesson for me in what was principle and what was path dependence. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, Kavita, perhaps uh, turn to you on that one as well. Same question. Yeah, so the biggest trap that I've seen firsthand is people try to implement models that are way too complex right off the bat. Um, so like right from research papers. So the problem with this is that you don't know how well it does in practice, whether it generalizes, whether it scales up, and most importantly, what are the cost implications of this? Um, so I would say always start with a time-tested approach that you know works reasonably well and establish a baseline before you add um, sophistication to it. Yeah, I mean, there's just this notion, I think a lot of people kind of skip this step of, how do I establish a baseline for this problem? What, what would humans be able to do on that? I think that's a, a really interesting challenge. And maybe, Dan, you want to speak about some of the traps you've seen people fall into? I mean, sort of following on this theme, I feel that people are often unclear on the sort of simple hypotheses they're testing, right? If you think in terms of agile software development, uh, there's a lot of discipline around minimal atomic tasks that you know when they're complete, but people often throw that away in this kind of data science ML world when they build these complex models and consider that a task when mm. they should really be trying to test minimal hypotheses. And I wanna dive into an example where uh, I was helping someone debug uh, their autocomplete functionality and they had a fairly complex function. It wasn't machine learned, it was sort of tuned, but I started piecing it apart and realizing, well, the main component seems to be query frequency. So I, I peeled off everything else, kept query frequency, pretty much the same problems. It's like, okay, that can't be it. Mm. And then I was like, there can't possibly be that people are searching for these things. So in a moment of peak, I went far enough down the list and started seeing 200 character queries in a, consumer website that they were making, you know, sort of frequency. I was like, that can't possibly be real. Mm. And then an engineer said, oh yeah, I guess we weren't filtering scrapers and, you know, other bots from there. It's like, you know, you might want to do that before you <laughs> use frequency. Yeah. And I just thought, like, just imagine 
what that's doing to machine learned ranking or other places where you're using not real free user behavior. And so I think the complexity masks all this. And if you started, if you're looking at simple things, you're less vulnerable. But the more and more complex things get, the harder it is to catch yeah. mistakes that are in the foundations. So I got a question about this, and I'm sorry, I'm just, Grant, I'm gonna hijack yeah, yeah. your panel. Yeah. Let's say it's 2012, and I do image classification work. And I've been doing it the, the standard off the shelf way for like 20 or 30 years. And this crazy guy named Jan LeCun, who I've been making fun of for like a decade, comes along and says, hey, I've got this new thing. It's now like 10% better than the state of the art or whatever. How do I now know when it's time to throw out all the simple stuff I know and replace it with this new thing? Mm. How do I do that? Proof of concept. Is that really? Is that a thing? I thought that was just like an enterprise software thing. People actually do those? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I got it. I don't know. This is, this is what if, I wonder um, about. If it doesn't take too much complexity to replace it, mm -hmm. then I think it's time to switch it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so there's a and? certain sunk cost argument there that, that hey, just be, you know, I'm really attached to my model, and I think you, know, you have to be willing to kill your models. I right? guess like, I feel like I went through this myself, where like, I, I am a long-term logistic regression. I've been doing logistic regressions for like 20 years. Logistic regression is my go-to kind of thing. And like a couple years ago, I got clued into this thing called XGBoost. And now XGBoost, gradient boosted trees, are now my go-to thing. And it just works better. It is just straight better. Same input, same features, everything. It's just gonna give me a, at least as good, if not better model every time for no additional computational costs, mm -hmm. no additional anything. And I'm trying to figure out like, how did I, like, was it just like people made fun of me for using logistic regression? Or like, how did I like, how did I switch? <laughs> we we make fun of you for other reasons. Lots of reasons, <laughs> lots of reasons. But, rightfully so, yeah. But I, I think, you know, the question is whether if you can try something simple, right, so it's, it's easy to test, mm -hmm. then I guess, of course, if you try something simple and it's better, that's great. If you try something simple and it's worse, but you have principled reasons to believe it will be mm -hmm. easier to iterate on it, mm -hmm. that at least suggests that, well, you shouldn't compare it to what you have now, but you should compare it to mm -hmm. where, where you started. So my, yeah. my former boss, uh, Igor uh, Parasek at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. uh, had these charts where the the new machine learned model would always be worse than the hand tuned one at first, and that's a hard sort of valley to go through. Of course, you don't need to launch at 100%. If it really is so easy to get high velocity of improvement, you should get there soon afterwards, and you don't wait, you don't complete your ramp until then. So true. That's the leap of faith in terms of investment. Right. All right, that's great, and I want to. I, I wish we could continue that, but I, we, we do only have a, f a few more minutes here, and I do want to uh, skip ahead. Uh, perhaps we can just really quickly show some of the panel poll results of people in the audience who have taken a few of these questions. So, uh, first off, on the experiments, I mean, I think a lot of you are in this camp of. Yeah, you're only doing a few of them, but you wish you could do more. I mean, I think, you know, perhaps for you, Josh, like how can people do more experiments? Like what's, what's some easy ways that they can get some wins on, on running more experiments? Um, I, I think if, <laughs> I'm trying to think, I can't be too snarky when I answer this. Um, you could be snarky. No, nah, I just, I'm, I don't even mean to slack. Um, Google has a policy where like, there is literally no change ever made, ever, that does not go out behind an experiment, mm -hmm. yeah. ever. That is the law, right, broadly speaking. Slack, due to some unfortunate incidents in the past couple of months, is basically moving to a very similar model. There's no new feature, there's no new code ever that does not go out behind gating experiment flag. Data-driven or nothing. Exactly, no. like that's it, for, right, for any let's... number of reasons. That, right. That's a cultural big push thing, but it's awesome when it happens. All right, next, next uh, poll result here, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish up with some of the ugly. I did promise to get to that. Uh, production language of choice, I think, uh, maybe Anu, looking at that, uh, any surprises you see in there? And I forgot, unfortunately, to put SQL in there, but mm. that didn't even <laughs> uh, tick the other categories. So. Uh, probably for this audience, not really that surprising to me. I'm, uh, I'm surprised that Java is ahead yeah. of Scala. Yeah. So. It's a lot, yeah. That's a lot of Java. Well, this is about getting it into production, too. So yeah. I think a lot of people go through this. They do Python off and build their models, and then yeah. they Java's right, their yeah. serving yeah. language. Yeah. So yeah, perhaps some bias in the question there. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Uh, and last but not least on the uh, fake news question. Ah, ah nobody. Wow. Mm. Wow. Just me. It's literally me. Yeah, no, I, I'm kind of with right. you. I think uh, that we might have to do that. And that's yeah. perhaps a... Uh, a good segue then into 
going back to uh, our, and I'm jumping ahead on slides, if we could put back up the, the ugly section and maybe we have a, a little bit of time here uh, before the party. So, you know, uh, let me start that off. You know, I think Mark Twain popularized the saying lies, damn lies, and statistics. I think if we were to modernize that, it would be lies, damn lies, and data science, right? So, Kavita, where does data science just flat out get it wrong? I think we tend to be too focused on the models, like developing really complex models and fancy ones. Impressing our friends. Impressing our friends, yeah. yes, and following the hype. Um, but we think less about cost implications, where the model's going to, what kind of products it's affecting, uh, how good, what the output should look like. Sometimes we just tweak to make it look nice for ourselves. So I think that's where data science get it, gets it wrong. I think we need to start thinking about cost and product impact. Yeah. Yeah. Anu, perhaps uh, since you work with so many of, of the public, like where does the public get it wrong when it comes to data science? I mean, I think many people, you often hear like, you know, there's this notion of killer robots and we're not gonna go into that too much, but like where does, the, where do, where does society just get it wrong? Like they just don't have it. Like if they could just learn this one thing about data science, it would change how they think about what we all do as practitioners. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, Data science is there to help them? I don't know, I, yeah. it's a pretty big question, yeah, loaded a question. question. So yeah. I, I feel like people think of data science as something like, oh my God, that's data science? What is that happening? And it's something behind the scenes and something fishy is happening. And if they just know that it's trying to help them get to a better place, I don't know, I, I'm using all wrong words I hear. Mm. But I think that that will make people feel better. Right now, if they see results which they don't expect, they always think that, oh, some, some machine learning models are happening. But at the same time, if something good is happening, they also reflect in a good way. So for example, we, in, at Reddit, we were using this HVD, and people immediately commented that, oh, looks like Reddit search is using machine learning. So they feel like something they don't understand is happening because of data science and machine learning. And I think that's where um, you know, we have to put a positive uh, influence on that and make sure that it helps people. We could tell them we don't understand it either. <laughs> be the thing too. Yeah, but you, you can't say that. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, so certainly a lot of people uh, forget the data part of data science, right? Uh, but they also forget the science part. But uh, they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Data like, science is either they, data they, they nor think, science. You know, I just need to throw an <laughs> algorithm at a problem and not realize, you know, look, I mean, data science is essentially, or machine learning in particular, is it, all about learning from the data you have. And the p people miss those basics and yeah they jump to complex models or they have uh stuff that they uh they read about you know for forget killer robots but they, this you know all this obsession with super intelligence uh, look i mean we, we we can barely get relevant ads in major social networks we have like the, the, and a lot of just that, some intelligence yeah. first yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, kind of reflecting on the regulation question, and I, interestingly enough, you all said we shouldn't be regulated, but I mean, I think one of the things you see in any industry is as soon as the politicians show up, they start saying, you know, hey, we need to regulate this, we need to regulate this, and every industry always says, no, we don't want any regulation, but, but no, oh, we'll regulate ourselves, we're, we're, we're good people, right? But, you know, I think, so, so what are some practical ways that data scientists can essentially self-regulate? Um, so let's say you're working on image recognition, try to use images that are representative of your population, um, and don't just bank on uh, off-the-shelf data sets. That's one way. Josh, any thoughts on that? Uh, feedback loops, feedback loops, feedback, <laughs> feedback loops. Seriously, like read, yeah. uh, there's a wonderful book, Thinking in Systems. It's an amazing book written like the late 90s. Absolutely fantastic. Um, highly, highly recommend it. Remember that you're bad at your job. I am very bad at my job. I assure most of you are probably bad at your jobs too. Like you're bad at your job. Don't be like too full of yourself. Like you're so awesome. Like Just write a doubt, bot to replace doubt yourself. yourself. Doubt, I mean, doubt yourself. Like be, yeah, be skeptical of yourself and all things Confidence inversely proportional to knowledge. Yeah, here, here, Anu. Yeah, so we try to depend on our um, moderators and the community to tell us what is correct and what is good and what is bad. So a lot of uh, lot of Reddit communities are more self, like volunteer moderator communities, and they basically try to tell us what type of content it is. So it's basically crowdsourcing. 
to figure out like which is on top of AI, so, you know, basically what people want and what people think is the most important. So that's why I'm saying that the regulation as an entity, instead of that, people as entity re regulating the content is much better. Last word on that one, Dan. Uh, I think the, the, we the weakest link in any of this work is, is often the person doing it, uh, who is, you know, has a very strong bias in believing that the work is good and, and right. So the best thing that I think you can do is to have always have at least a devil's advocate. There should always be two experiments, ideally two people, so that you're not you know, overly invested in a single approach being right. That's the best practical technique I've found. Devil's advocate is a service. That's, that would be awesome. Yeah, devil's yeah. advocate is a service. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. If anyone would like to fund me, I'm going to start that like right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, on that. I think we'll, we'll wrap up. And, and I'll just say, too, you know, this is a, is a super important question. And in fact, tomorrow morning we've dedicated a, a, a whole keynote to this whole topic of ethics and AI. Because I, I do think as practitioners, it's, it's one of those things that we're just like, hey, I'm an engineer and this is really cool to work on this stuff. But there's, there's broad implications to it. And so we're, we're going to delve into that tomorrow a little bit more. Uh, I know we're, we're just a little bit over time, so I'm going to spare one last question for each of the panelists here, and, and uh, we're going to look into the future because, hey, machine learning is about predicting things. So uh, just real quick, you know, for each of the panelists, as we flash forward to Activate next year, I don't know where it is just yet, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll announce it soon after, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, what do you, what, what's a topic in machine learning, AI, and search that you're really looking forward to hearing about more next year? And Kavita, let's, or actually, you know what, Daniel, let's start with you on that one, and we'll finish with Kavita. Yeah. Uh, I love, I love keywords in search, but I have to imagine that, you know, lots of people imagine a world where search is no longer explicit text, and I would love to see if there's a real future that's going in that direction where the primary input is no longer an explicit request. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more on like deep learning and search and how we can use, before people even search, how we mm -hmm. can predict what people want to search. Yeah. Great, Josh? Uh, security stuff probably, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the Rexis space around like ablation, like what happens if users can delete their records and all kinds of interesting stuff like that. I'm just absolutely fascinated by this area. What models are robust? To having data be deleted or changed from underneath you, I would love to be talking about that. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Kavita, last word. Um, so I'd like to see um, more, more why models fail. So more of a case study mm -hmm. and how we can take it from 50% accuracy to 90% accuracy and how do you build models that deploy into production. Mm. Fantastic. So there you have it. So if you want to be, uh, you want to be a speaker next year, you've got some great topics there around. How do you make this stuff practical? So, with that, let's give a, a warm round of applause to our panelists. I just want to again extend a, a personal. Thank you to all of you for, for showing up and, and bringing your brains and talent to the, to the day here. So uh, with that, we're going to shift gears. It's time to party. Uh, it should be in the app of where we're going. This is a very short walk to the, uh, to the venue. Do make note there is a hockey game tonight as well, and it's right next door, so there's going to be a lot of crazy people dressed in Canadians gear and all of that good stuff. So just make sure you're, you're not getting caught up in all of that, I guess. Uh, details are in the app. And then just last but not least, as I said this morning, just reflect one more time on all of this wouldn't be possible without the support of so many great sponsors. So do take time to visit those folks. Thank you very much. Hey, sponsors.